speakers for all your amazing speeches uh, uh, to the moderator. I'm so happy to hear that she spent uh, two years in St. Petersburg and she speaks very well Russian. Uh, it's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be part of this significant uh, event um, under the theme of the Path of Changing World Post Russian Ukrainian War. Okay, I don't agree totally with the Russian Ukrainian War, and I will explain to you why. Uh, also, in the videos uh, that uh, in the video that has been presented, uh, and our uh, esteemed moderator said that it all started in 2022. It didn't start in 2022. It started much earlier. Because uh, if we don't look back at the causes of this conflict, uh, we cannot understand why actually the, all this happened and what impact it has and why the reaction in the world was such as it was, as we, uh, we've all seen. And if we don't understand that, we cannot understand what will happen post uh, the conflict. The conflict will end sooner or later. But what will happen afterwards, that is very important. But if we don't understand the roots, the cause, the essence of this conflict, we uh, cannot make any predictions or try to influence the situation. So how did it all start? Well, but before I go um, to the Ukrainian uh, conflict, may I ask you something, you know, uh, it's, it's for me, you know, I'm, I'm very interested, you know, uh, how young people uh, react towards Russia and what they know about Russia. So, please, the first thing that comes to my mind, to your mind, is when you hear Russia. Please, uh, at least a whole second in Russia, don't, don't. <laughs> don't say anything. Okay, what? First thing comes to your mind, please. You hear Russia, what do you think about? Hmm? Bear? Bear, Masha and the bear. <laughs> my, my daughter's name is Masha. And she's exactly like that. The character in the, in the cartoon. Okay, what else? Only Masha and the bear? Huh? And what about the biggest country in the world? Yes. 17 million square meters, uh, kilometers, sorry. Uh, you know that the territory of Russia equals the surface of planet Pluto. That's how big it is. Surrounded by 16 uh, seas and uh, oceans. But only three of them warm enough to swim in, in the summer, just for three months. You're very lucky you know, in Indonesia to have this kind of uh, climate. Okay, maybe you can name some of the Russian leaders, uh, not only Putin, Putin you know all, yeah, but other Russian leaders? Gorbachev. Or Soviet? Gorbachev. Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Uh, Yeltsin, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, okay, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, or a couple, last week, uh, we celebrated the 74th anniversary of our diplomatic relations between uh, Russia and Indonesia. So can you name three buildings that was built by my country in Jakarta? One? No, no one knows? Absolutely. Another one? Roma Sakit Tugutani. Even Monas, uh, not built, but it was uh, financed by, by, by our country. So, uh, okay, so uh, you know some things about, about Russia, <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite happy to hear that. So, going back to uh, the Ukrainian conflict. In 1991, as you know, the Soviet Union has disintegrated. Before, we were one country with Ukraine. 
Ukraine was never ever in history before 1991 an independent country. It was always part of Russia, be it the Russian Empire before uh, 1917 or the Soviet Union, we were one country. And Russians and Ukrainians are practically the same people. We speak practically the same language, just a little difference, you know, like uh, just a little difference, like, like between Lao and Thai, or between, I don't know, maybe even Bahasa. Billions of dollars, it's an open secret. Uh, Victoria Nuland admitted it openly. They invested billions of dollars into turning Ukraine into an anti-Russian project. They brainwashed the people and that's ex actually an excellent example of how uh, this political technologist could work. You know, turning uh, people who are our brothers, brainwashing them into believing that we are their enemies. People of older generation who, with whom we live together in the Soviet Union, they keep their mouths shut because they understand. But young people, already grew up in the independent Ukraine, they were and are still brainwashed into believing that Russia is their enemy. And they were looking to Europe, Ukrainians I mean, they were thinking that Europe will embrace them as their brothers and sisters also, as their equals, but it never happened. The whole plan for Ukraine was to be an anti-Russian instrument. In 2000, but before 2014 it was okay. Our relations were still normal. In 2014 there was a coup d'etat in Ukraine and a very anti-Russian, even a Russophobic government came to power. They were supported by Europeans and the United States. This coup d'etat was absolutely illegal, very bloody, but all this, you know, beautiful words about uh, human rights, the Europeans and the United States, they never said them. So it was okay. It was supported by Europe and the United States. The third thing they did, it was President Poroshenko, if you remember. Uh, the first thing they did, this new government, they tried to ban everything Russian in Ukraine. Remember I told you, 50% are ethnic Russians, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbas area, Danish, Lugansk, and Crimea. They tried to adopt a law ban banning Russian language, and not only is an official language, okay, they have Ukrainian language, but banning it in just everyday life. You go to a shop, you will get fined if uh, you speak Russian. You cannot send your children, if you're Russian, to a Russian school. You cannot read Russian books. You cannot watch Russian movies. You know, it's like banning, imagine, like trying to ban uh, French in Belgium, English in Ireland, Javanese in Java, Balinese in Bali. Would people be happy? Of course not. So, the eastern part of Ukraine reacted uh, very strongly because 90% there are ethnic Russians. They started to protest because they want to speak their own language. Okay, they can, uh, you know, use Ukrainian in, uh, in official situations, but they want to speak Russian with their children, with their friends. Uh, they want to be part of the Russian culture. Instead of trying to solve the situation in a peaceful way, uh, Kiev sent troops to these uh, regions. Do you know, you will never find it in uh, Western media, that between 2014 and 2018, uh, the Ukrainian regime killed 14,000 people in Donbass area. 14,000 people, civilians. Women, children, old people in this eight years before our special military operation started in Ukraine.
And everyone in Europe and in the United States, they didn't say a word about human rights. And at that time, Donetsk and Lugansk were part of Ukraine. Crimea went back to Russia in 2014. They, uh, you know that Crimea was never actually Ukrainian. It's Khrushchev for some reason has given uh, Crimea to Ukraine, but at that time it didn't matter because we were one country, so it was just uh, another region of uh, our country, so we didn't matter. So, and they, they and also it, it was very democratic, by the way. You know, they had a referendum. And the people of Crimea voted in favor of going back first to become independent and then to go back to Russia and we accepted that. Okay, you remember that in Kosovo there was no referendum and still the West supports independence of Kosovo. In Crimea there was a referendum and the West say it's illegal. Double standards all the time. Okay, so Crimea went back to Russia and Donetsk and Lugansk started to fight back Ukrainian troops who were killing their people. How can Russia, you know, look at it indifferently when Russian people are being killed? But for eight years we are trying to solve this conflict in a peaceful manner. We urged Kiev to engage in dialogue with their own people because they, they, they saw these people as still uh, their uh, Ukrainian citizens. There were Minsk agreements signed in 2014, not between Russia and Ukraine, but between Kiev and the leadership of these two regions. And uh, these Minsk agreements provided a very clear roadmap how to solve this issue in a peaceful manner and still for these two regions be part of Ukraine. Uh, Kiev agreed to give a special autonomous status to these two regions so that the people there could be, uh, speak Russian language, have Russian schools, uh, but still be part of Ukraine. In eight years, these agreements were not fulfilled by Kiev, not by, by Russia. We were not part of these agreements. We, were just, we just endorsed them. And you know why? Actually, uh, when the uh, military operation in Ukraine started, um, the, some of the leaders of Europe, for instance, you know Angela Mer Merkel, the former chancellor of uh, Germany, she admitted that neither Kiev nor Europe, which also endorsed this agreement, had no intention to commit to them. The only reason why they supported this agreement was to gain time and arm in Ukraine. So, uh, in 2021, in December, uh, before that, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, declared that uh, Ukraine will be keep, become a member of NATO. This very peaceful uh, military alliance that bombed Yugoslavia that bombed uh, Libya, Iraq, as you know. Uh, imagine why, it, and it, of course it was uh, absolutely uh, impossible for us, because uh, we have a 2,000 uh, kilometers border with uh, Ukraine. Imagine the uh, infrastructure of uh, NATO coming to our border. Two minutes, missile reach Moscow. Possible. Still, we asked from NATO guarantees for our security. We even drafted an agreement on peace guarantees for Russia, uh, asking uh, NATO not to bring Ukraine and for Ukraine to stay neutral. And of course, we would like them to be friendly. NATO dismissed, they rejected our proposals. And it was clear by 2022 that they were preparing a massive offensive on Crimea and uh, Donbass area. So as our president said, uh, when you see that a fight is coming, perhaps you need to strike first. 
So this was a very difficult decision taken by uh, our country to stop this military operation. And this conflict is not about Ukraine. It's conflict. In this, in this conflict, Ukraine is a victim and it's a tragedy for Ukrainian people. It's not a victim of Russia. It's a victim of Western policies because they used and are using Ukraine as an instrument to attack our country. We are a nuclear power. They don't want a direct confrontation with the nuclear power. Understand that. So they are using Ukrainians to try to weaken and destroy Russia. Okay, so the question is why? Why? Why they are doing it? Why was the reaction so strong? Look, Americans attacked 27 foreign countries after World War II. You know that. It's not Russia, it's not China, it's this Americans, United States of America, the most peaceful and democratic country in the world, as they say, they attack military, 27 foreign countries. You know, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, uh, Yugoslavia, etc. Et they are the only country in the world that use nuclear weapons against Japan. They are the country, only country in the world that massively use chemical weapons against Vietnam. So, has anyone applied sanctions against the United States? No. Israel attacking Palestine. Where are the sanctions against Israel? Why is the reaction of the West, or as they call themselves, the civilized world? We are all not civilized world. Indonesia, Russia, China, we're uncivilized world. They are just civilized. That's what they call themselves. So it's uh, United States, Canada, uh, European Union, Australia, New Zealand. The rest of the world is uncivilized. So why, why uh, is the uh, direction of the civilized world was so strong to, uh, towards this uh, conflict? We are, you know, uh, never ever any country in the world has uh, been uh, in so many sanctions has been imposed on, on, on our country. We are the champions. Never ever there was such, you know, uh, actions beyond any common sense when uh, the culture, uh, Russian culture is trying to be banned in, in European countries. For instance, I remember very well there was an international international competition of cats. Russian cats were banned. <laughs> what what have cats to do with anything? Or Russian sport uh, men are banned from uh, participating in, in in the Olympics, which actually side politics. When our assets, you, you know, that our central bank assets were frozen. They call it frozen, but in fact they stole it. So the reaction was unproportional, I would say. Why? The question is why. And I, I can answer. Because we dare to oppose the Western dominance. Because we say why the small group of countries have the right to tell the whole world what to do and how to be. What, what, why they are not taking interest of other countries in, in, into consideration. You know, uh, the problem with them, they use very beautiful words like democracy, human rights, freedom. This word democracy is just fine. Freedom is wonderful. Human rights need to be protected. There, there is no one argues about that. But if you look at what they do, it's very, very far away from what they say. 
When they bombed Yugoslavia in 1991, you know that. They bombed a country in the middle of Europe because they didn't like the regime there. They killed more than 2,000 people there. And they call it collateral damage. Not victims, not people, just collateral damage. You know, They killed one million people in Iraq under false pretense. Do you remember that? They, used, they, they accused Iraq of having uh, weapons of mass destruction and uh, Colin Powell produced this vial with some white powder. It turned out it was washing powder and Iraq didn't have any uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. But they killed one million people there because their prosperity is based on their dominance, on looting other countries for centuries during colonial times and post-colonial times. You in Indonesia you know that very well. Because what they want from uncivilized countries cheap natural resources, cheap labor, and they sell us expensive goods. It's just, if, if you put it, you can put it in, of course it's much more complicated than that, but you can put it in simple words. And then it's very clear what is the cause of this conflict, because we dare to oppose it. We say, you know, the concept of the United States is like, we're the best, we're the strongest, we're the most democratic, we bomb other countries, but in a very democratic way. So, if you do what we say, we will be okay, more or less. We will still uh, get your natural resources, your uh, brains, you know, we will pump you out of everything, but you will be okay, more or less. If you don't do what we say, we will, we will destroy you economically and military, and we've seen it happen with many, many countries in the world. I've already given you the examples uh, of, of that. We Russians, we say, no, you don't have the right to do so. All countries are equal. The multipolar world was mentioned. The multipolar world means that, and it's, uh, uh, please understand me, uh, correctly. It's not that it's just a fantasy of Russia. It is happening in reality. Uh, we are seeing a transition from this uh, unipolar world dominated by the United States to a multipolar one. Because center of power are raising economic power and with economic development comes political influence of course. So we see China, India, ASEAN countries and Indonesia, of course, the world is changing. That's what the West cannot agree to, because if, and we are proposing this concept, that, and we're promoting this concept, that everyone is equal, that all interests of all countries, be big or small, should be protected and taken into consideration. That's what we want. You know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we were under the illusion that the West will treat us as equals. Because no more communist ideology, we are all capitalists. You know, it never happened. They never treated us as equal, because they don't treat anyone as equal. They don't treat Russia, they don't China, Indonesia, or other countries. Uh, and uh, I love their arrogance, you know, they, they even admitted openly, you know, Joseph Borrell said once that Europe is a blooming garden and all the other world, the whole world is a jungle. Okay, we all live in a jungle. Congratulations. And just Europe is a blooming garden. So it's, uh, that's the way they see the world. But uh, this transition is happening sooner or later, and I'm sure sooner, uh, the, the Western dominance will end. And now the question is, like you put it in the, what will be the post-conflict world? What we hope and what we are promoting, that it will be a world that will be more just, 
that will take into consideration the interest of all countries. But, you know, not, of course we understand, not all, all, all countries now dare to say so, to protest, because they are strong. And they are still military strong. So, some countries just don't dare. But when they say that Russia is isolated, it's not true. We see the support from the majority countries of the world because uh, the sanctions were imposed only by a small group of countries, the so-called civilized world. The majority of countries never joined. We see the support from, from uh, the Muslim countries, from Latin American countries, from African countries, from Asian countries. And also that brings me uh, to the subject of values. You know, uh, you've probably read this uh, Clash of Civilization by Huntington, yeah? uh, And in a very simple way, I would say, that uh, we thought that this clash of civilization, this divide, is about religion. Islam and Christianity. But it is not. We see now very clearly that it's not about Islam, and Islamophobia is very much promoted in the West. It's not about religion, because basically all religions are about the same. Be it Islam or Christianity, it's about love. It's about love. Love for God, love for your country, love for your parents, love for your family. It's about values and lack of values. And unfortunately, what we see now in Europe, we always admired Europe, you know, for their culture, for they came out with Christianity, they came out with, but they are destroying it now. The religion is being destroyed. The family is being destroyed. All the values that you know we are committed to, we, we in Russia we are committed to these values. They are being destroyed. All this aggressive LGBT agenda, uh, you know. Uh, actually, we are not homophobic. Okay, you want to do whatever you want to do in your country. It's it, you can do it. Why promoting? Why imposing it on the whole world? Uh, also, the liberal ideas. Okay, they, they, sign, they, they sound very beautiful, of course, that uh, the, what is the essence of liberal ideas? Is that uh, maybe for you young people, you know, young generation, they're, uh, they're a little bit different from, <laughs> from the older generation. Uh, the liberal idea is that the most important thing in our world is the person and your freedom. But we think that there are more important things in the world because the freedom of one person ends where the freedom of another person starts. For instance, I'm, I'm really free, I want to kill you. But you're also free, yeah? And you don't want to be killed. So there, there should be, uh, there, there are things that are more important. And um, also, you know, maybe I'm saying pathetic things, but also the value is something that you're ready to die for. Are you ready to die for your country? Or for your religion? In Europe, they're not. That's why they're using Ukrainians to fight against Russia. Because they don't care about the Ukrainians. We do care. We do care about the Ukrainians. We are trying to spare them. We're targeting only military infrastructure because they are our brothers and sisters. So uh, what we are seeing now is, uh, again, it's a very difficult and a very painful transformation of our world. But hopefully, when the crisis will end, and we will win. Because, uh, because we know that we're right that we're on the right side of history. No, no doubts about that. Uh, and that's why 
the policies of President Putin is so much supported by uh, our people, by Muslims in our country. Ukrainian war. It's not about Ukraine. Uh, on our bilateral relations with uh, Indonesia, as I mentioned, uh, 74 years of diplomatic relations, and uh, next year we will be celebrating the 75th uh, diplomatic relations, quite a long time. And of course you know that our countries were especially close uh, in the 60s, uh, during uh, President Sukarno, who visited our country, how many times, do you know? Four. And do you know the story of Gilora Boncarno, how it was built? Uh, Gilora Boncarno is an uh, exact copy of Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow. It's the biggest stadium in Moscow and uh, he uh, made a public lecture there and he liked it so much that he asked Nikita Khrushchev to build a similar one in Jakarta for Indonesia to be able to host second Asian Games. And it was built. So you see Gilora Bunkarna now, which is a twin with Luzhniki uh, Stadium, it's, it's, it's there in Moscow. You, you go to Moscow, you see it in Moscow, do you been to Moscow? Yeah, yeah Luzhniki, same, same, uh, it has been a little bit renovated, but, but still it's, it's uh, the, same, the same project. Um, and, uh, you know, the people of uh, older generation, like my parents, uh, you say Indonesia to them, they will say Sukarno. Most young people now will say Bali, but uh, Indonesia is so much more than Bali, of course. Uh, so uh, we uh, actually we provide a lot of assistance to your country. Um, we help you to preserve your territorial integrity with Papua provinces. Have you been to Surabaya? Have you seen the submarine? It's Russian submarine. Oh, you didn't know that? Uh, it's a Russian submarine. Uh, it was given uh, by uh, to the government of Indonesia uh, to help you to protect your uh, your territorial integrity. It was it served for more than around 20 years. It was decommissioned in, in the 70s and uh, the monument. It became a museum. Uh, actually, uh, last year we opened a, uh, a memorial plaque there saying that this is a symbol of our friendship and of our good uh, cooperation. Of course, during Suharto times, uh, our relations were not so close, but still Suharto visited uh, Soviet Union also. Uh, and it became um, it started to rise again uh, after Ibumi Gawati Sukarno Putri visited uh, Moscow in 2003 and met with President Putin. So uh, since then, uh, our relations have been developing. Uh, and, you know, uh, I can tell you, for us, we see Indonesia as uh, our key partner in this part of the world. Uh, because Indonesia is a leader of ASEAN, Indonesia is a very important player in the Muslim world, uh, and we have 30 million Muslims in our country, which are not migrants, which are people who lived there for centuries. Their ancestors lived in our country for centuries. Uh, and Indonesia is become founder of the non-alignment movement, movement. So Indonesia is very important for us. And the stronger Indonesia gets, the better for us. Because you know, for the United States, they don't want anyone to be strong because they seek global dominance. Do they want strong Indonesia? No. Do they want strong China? No, of course. Do they want strong Russia sanctioned, yeah? To weaken, to weaken Russia or Ukraine to attack us military. Uh, but we don't seek global dominance. Russia, uh, please also understand uh, me correctly, we, we don't want to replace the United States as a world hegemon. God forbid, because hegemons, they usually end uh, in a bad way. Uh, we want to have equal partners with whom we can talk on an equal basis. So the stronger Indonesia gets, the better for us.
because uh, Indonesia then will not uh, give in to the pressure from the West. And we are very grateful for your country, for your government, the way you uh, conducted um, your uh, G20 presidency and also your chairmanship in ASEAN. It's not a secret that there was a big pressure to Indonesia to kick us out from G20 or from ASEAN meetings, and it never happened. We appreciate that very much. The very balanced position of uh, Indonesia. Our president has sent a congratulatory uh, message uh, to President Joko Widodo, uh, congratulating him on the success of uh, Indonesia G20 presidency. Uh, you can ask me maybe you're interested in the peace initiatives by Indonesia on the uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict. Uh, President Joko Widodo spoke to President Putin in 2022. He visited Kiev, then he visited Moscow. They had a very good meeting with President Putin, lasted more than two hours. Also, you know, Prabowo uh, Subianto came out with the peace initiative last year during the uh, Shangri-La dialogue. You know, we welcome all peace initiatives. We are ready to consider. The problem is that with the peace initiative of Prabowo, immediately the Ukrainians said no. No. They are not ready to engage any kind of dialogue with, uh, with our country. Our president has said many times, we are open for dialogue. They say no. And, and their sponsors in the West say no. Uh, I also would like to remind you, maybe you know it, maybe you don't, that uh, when the crisis started in April 2022, we conducted five rounds of uh, negotiations with Ukraine in Turkey. We drafted an agreement on our terms, and Ukrainians were ready to accept it. Then you know what happened? And our troops were near Kiev already at that time. You know what happened? Ukrainians told us, okay, we're signing the agreement, it's ready, it's been drafted, everyone agreed on that. You withdraw our troops, your troops from Kiev, and we will sign them. We did, we did. You know, we believe them. You know, we believe. We used to believe our Western partners and Ukrainians, but they lie all the time. Uh, now we don't believe them anymore. Uh, that's one of the lessons we have. Uh, then Boris Johnson comes to Kiev. He was the prime minister of, as we say in Russia, former Great Britain. Uh, and uh, immediately Zelensky orders his delegation to walk out from, from the negotiations. And, and, and the fight continues. And then Zelensky signs a decree forbidding any kind of dialogue with Russia. So uh, we welcome the initiative by Indonesia. And uh, it's not the lack of uh, parties who would like to mediate or who have our Chinese friend also did that. It's a position of Ukraine and its sponsor. On our, again, back to our relations to Indonesia. Uh, you know, uh, if we look uh, at our trade, it has been growing despite all the difficulties, uh, geopolitical difficulties. Last year we've seen a growth of around 30%. It's around 4 or 4 billion US dollars. It's not enough. Of course, if we uh, look at our combined population of more than 400 million, we can do better. But we are making efforts. For instance, we now are engaged in negotiations between the Eurasian Economic Union and, and Indonesia to have a free trade agreement. You know that Eurasian Economic Union comprises five countries. It's Russia, Belarus, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, all former republics of the Soviet Union. And uh, we uh, hope that by the end of the year, we will have a free trade agreement with Indonesia. Of course, that will boost our trade and economic cooperation. Uh, we have uh, investment projects that we're working uh, on. Uh, we I already men mentioned that uh, we have uh, educational exchanges, 800 
<laughs> your <laughs> witness of that. Uh, we have uh, 800 students, Indonesian students, studying right now in uh, Russia. If you're interested, we Russian government is giving uh, scholarships, 300 per year. It's a bachelor, masters, and postgraduate. Um, so if you're interested, we can give you links to where to get information and what documents you need. Our moderator studied uh, three years in St. Petersburg. I hope you never regretted it. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful city, of course. Um, yes, it is cold in Russia. Yes, it is cold. <laughs> it is true. Three weeks ago, it was minus 28 in Moscow. <laughs> but our moderator survived, so <laughs> you can see you can look, looking quite happy and pretty. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so you can you can manage, you can manage, and the quality of education is high. Uh, and if you have a scholarship, it will be free for you. Also, there is another option uh, on a commercial basis. Uh, if you want to study uh, some some subjects in Russia, you can look up. At there's websites of your, our universities, they accept students on commercial basis. And it's more, much more affordable than, say, in, uh, Australia or Europe or the United States. And it's safe. Is it safe? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, don't believe the Western media or the Hollywood movies, uh, which are always uh, presenting Russians as uh, bad guys. Uh, Moscow and is the one of the safest capitals uh, in, uh, in in the world, I would say, you know, or Saint Petersburg. It's, it's, it's very. Of course, you shouldn't wander, you know, at night at some faraway places, but it's like in any other city in the world. Uh, so, uh, if you're interested, you are most welcome. Uh, and we hope. And uh, uh, this year is 300 uh, scholarships, but I think in the future we will give more because, of course, with your uh, population, it's not enough. Because, for instance, uh, your neighboring countries, uh, like Malaysia, they have 3,000 students, uh, Myanmar or Vietnam. So, uh, quite, a, quite a big number of students from Southeast Asia. Uh, what we really hope to do, more, uh, to do more is to have more cultural exchange. You know, we had big plans for the 70th anniversary of our diplomatic relations, but because of COVID, it wasn't done. But uh, we hope that maybe this year and next year, for the 75th anniversary, uh, coming to uh, Indonesia, uh, we have plans to have uh, Days of Moscow here in, uh, in Jakarta, and Days of Tatarstan, which is a Muslim region of Russia, as, as you know, uh, your embassy did wonderful uh, Indonesian cultural festivals in Moscow for four years before COVID. It was amazing. You know, people just, uh, hundreds of thousands of people visited it. And it, it was in the center of Moscow. It was just uh, really, really, I, I am so jealous. Yeah. I, I, I would like to do something similar. And, uh, in, in Jakarta, of course. Uh, tourist exchanges, Bali, full of Russians, as you know. Uh, and for your information, if you want to go to Russia as a tourist, uh, now it's much easier because for uh, 50 friendly countries, including Indonesia, we've introduced electronic visas. So you don't need to go to the embassy with a package of documents. You just go to the website, you load your passport, you fill in all the forms and then you receive a visa uh, for uh, 14 days. So you are most welcome. Again, it is safe. <laughs> okay, you, you don't go to the border with uh, Ukraine, of course. But Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, Asian part of Russia, like I've never been there. I'm ashamed, but I've never been to Asian part of uh, Russia, like Vladivostok, Novosibirsk, Lake Baikal. There's so many things to see and do in Russia. So I think I'll, I'll yeah, I'll end on that. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have questions, I'll
don't believe what they, they are saying. Really, I stopped watching BBC or CNN. <laughs> Disgusting. You know, you know, I, thought, you know, I explained many times to my friends about this conflict in yeah. 2014. No, not like that. The history goes like this and this, and the Mesopotamia is not my opinion. So, um, uh, I'm glad to say that I know you have a lot of questions in your head right now. Uh, before that, I, will, uh, I would like to about our question and answer session. Before asking, please uh, raise your hand and mention your name and your organization or your institution. Okay? And participants must know to us anything unrelated to the topic. Okay? And then please use English for the question if you may. And then please be focused and to the And please do not use any improper words or offensive words. So who would like to kick off the question and answer? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, we only received four. Okay, I'm one by one. One by one, okay, one by one. Uh, I need to choose, right? <laughs> okay, maybe for Russia because for me it represents how uh, non-Western country can can have such a great influence and power in the world. And for my question, uh, the question is with so much political allegations directed to Russia regarding the conflict, how does Russia uh, stand up and still manage to participate in the world dynamics? Thank you so much. Yeah, well, yeah. Good evening. My name is... My name is Ketan Kapoyara. Uh, I'm from uh, JYM University Faculty for Law. So my question is, uh, in back to history, uh, after World War II, NATO uh, is present and born, and uh, the Russia is uh, makes a part of Warsaw Pact. So my question is, uh, my question is, in the future, will the Russian Federation create or? make a strong alliance to other countries or Indonesia and other uh, countries. So that's my question. Thank you. Okay, hello. So let me introduce myself. My name is Nurwai Anjum Putri from Pratiri University in 2022. So let's talk uh, I would like to ask you a question. As I mentioned from your previous material, Ukraine was Russia before. But let's talk about diplomatic relations uh, between Indonesia and Russia. And of course, we hope that the methods can be able to stop the conflict as soon as possible with the minimum possible possibilities. So my question is, in, term, in terms of the number of war companies affected, are Russian companies in Indonesia also affected by the conflict itself? So I'm very interested about diplomatic relation between Indonesia and Russia, and so that's my question. Thank you so much. Okay, Shakira, I'm from Jayabaya University. I want to ask that the former United States President Donald Trump said in the interview that if he were still president, he would end the Russian and Ukrainian conflict within 24 hours. What is your perspective on Mr. Trump's statement? Thank you. Uh, efforts to isolate Russia, it comes just from a small group of countries. And uh, it's not true that Russia is isolated, you know, because we have so many friends and allies uh, in, in the world. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, uh, despite this uh, information, you know, uh, what is going on actually, especially in the media also, it's uh, not even, uh, as our president said, uh, not even information terror, it's information war. Uh, we engage not only you know in the conflict in, in Ukraine, but it's an information war. Because whatever bad happens in the world, Putin did it. You know that. You know we even have a joke. I think I, I told it that you know the Dead Sea, Dead Sea between Jordan and Israel. You know why it's dead? Because Putin killed it. That's that's how. Well, it's not true, of course. It's a joke. But it's <laughs> but it's how. Uh, the Western media always uh, portray portray Russia, uh, and it's it's 
a, it's a fight going on, you know. So we're fighting, yeah, we're fighting to reach out to people of other countries. Uh, for them to be able to know what is really happening, or what is uh, Russian view and what is our position on what is happening uh, in the world. Uh, you know that these uh, very democratic countries that promote freedom of speech, they all banned, like Europe and the United States, they all banned all Russian media. It's just banned. Because why? And, uh, you, you ask me why? Because they are afraid that their own people will have access to this alternative point of view. And maybe their uh, view of the world will change. They are afraid. Uh, so that's why they are preventing our media working in, in, other, in other countries. Thank God Indonesia is a really democratic country, so we will soon have Russia today here. Uh, and you can still have Russia today. Yeah, you can uh, you can have it. You can, if you're interested in what we think, you can watch uh, uh, Russia today. So, uh, but we are, you know, we, we remain and we will remain uh, a very important player in the world because uh, we are the member, permanent member of Security Council. We won World War Two. You know, uh, it's uh, you know. Uh, said, I don't remember, that if you don't know your history, the country that doesn't know its history doesn't have a future. So if you don't know history, you cannot understand the present and you cannot see the future or uh, what, what will happen in the future. So uh, actually uh, our country was winner in World War II, whatever the West is trying to say now, uh, that it was the United States who won the war. No, it's not true. They joined the war in 1944, when it was uh, evident that we are already winning. Uh, we lost 27 million people in World War II. You know how many Americans lost? 400,000. So that actually is very, you know, um, clear example. So, and we... We cannot be uh, kicked out of uh, these uh, formats because uh, United States, they just want it. It will not happen because, again, we have so many allies and, and friends uh, in the world. And uh, again, we feel that we are right. We are fighting for a cause that will benefit everyone. We are not fighting, to, again, to replace the United States as a uh, world dominant force. No, we don't want it. We were fighting for a world that we, will be just and fair for everyone. That's why we will win. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. But actually, one of the reasons, uh, you know how, how NATO deceived us also, they uh, were, uh, you know that uh, Okay, it's history again. <laughs> Lesson in history. You know that Germany was divided, yeah, uh, because of World War II. As a result, and uh, then uh, the Machos agreed for Germany to reunite, but in exchange, they promised us not to expand NATO. We fulfilled our promise. Germany was allowed. We, we had troops in Eastern Germany. Uh, our troops. Uh, we withdrew our troops from Eastern Germany. Germany reunited. And NATO expanded five rounds of expansion. Again, they lied. That's what they always do. So uh, we are not seeking military alliances. We have a military alliance with some of uh, the former republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's called the Organization um, uh, on the Security Treaty, the Collective Security Treaty. Uh, we have uh, joint exercises, etc. Uh, we have close uh, defense relations with China, but we are not a military alliance uh, with China. Uh, we, we don't seek this kind of alliances, you know. Uh, we, uh, because in a sense, military alliances, they are, uh, they uh, divide the world. You know, like uh, what is happening now in the Asia Pacific, like AUKUS or Quad. These uh, mini-lateral uh, alliances, do they help 
to make this part of the world more secure? No. No, of course not, because they create more and more divisive lines. They divide countries into these alliances. So that's not what we're seeking. We're seeking a security architecture that will comprise all the countries, small or big, and uh, that will provide for their security interests to be protected. That's what we're looking at. Thank you. But uh, the impact on the world is not from the conflict per se. It's not from Russians fighting against Ukrainians or Ukrainians against Russians. It's not about that. It's about the response from the West. It's about the measures taken uh, by the West to weaken Russia. They, they admit openly or uh, the best to destroy Russia, to make it disintegrate like the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, the impact comes from the sanctions. And of course, you know, I'm not saying that uh, sanctions actually uh, uh, do not affect the way we are doing business. But we are just, we are just. You know, uh, the hope for the West was that our economy would be destroyed, uh, that Russian people will suffer because. What is the reason of introducing sanctions? Whatever they say, you know, don't be the words. It's to make people suffer and overthrow the regime that they don't like. But it didn't happen with Russia because our economy adjusted, uh, our economy is very resilient, and in a sense, uh, the. Oh, I'll give you the example, you know, while Germany is in recession, we are growing like 3-4% per year, our GDP. Of course, we cannot compete with Indonesia, 5%, which is wonderful, but still we, our economy is growing. Uh, while uh, the countries that introduce sanctions are in, in recession. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, these uh, this, uh, sanctions are a blessing because uh, the big transnational companies left, Russian business comes. Because before, some of the Russian businesses could, could not compete with these big transnational companies, you know. But now, they're there, and they're developing their own businesses. Uh, again, uh, Russia is the biggest uh, country in the world in territory. We have natural resources, you know, oil, gas. We have a well-educated population. We have technologies. So, you know, just give us time. Of course, uh, you know, if we didn't produce smartphones because we didn't feel the need, we could buy it from other countries. If we cannot, we can produce our own. If we can produce uh, sophisticated defense equipment, like Sukhoi 35, of course we can produce pretty much anything. But uh, it's just, it's not that we want to, you know, just to close up and we want, we want to have normal relations with other countries. And of course, uh, the financial sanctions, they hurt, of course, because it's, uh, for instance, it's not easy to, you know, uh, you go to Russia, you will not be able to use your card. You have to bring cash. Or I'm not, I cannot use my card here in Indonesia because of the financial sanctions, or to make transactions between banks. It's not possible possible right now for, for uh, uh, Russian businesses. But there are ways, there are ways, of course. So uh, our businesses have uh, adjusted, uh, our economy has adjusted, and um, we see a very big interest uh, from our companies and our businesses towards Indonesia and ASEAN as a whole. Because, well, it's the reality that before our before the crisis, our big majority of our business was oriented towards Europe. And it's understandable because we are close, uh, we have extended relations with the European Union, it was our number two trade partner after China. Uh, but they severe, they just cut all the ties with us. It was not we who wished that that's what they did, and actually they shoot themselves in the, in, in the defeat. Now they are, because they don't have any of our cheap natural resources anymore, they are, their economy is in recession. So, uh, of course, uh, 
we are affected by that, but we adjust and uh, it's getting better and better. So uh, we're very optimistic. We have many partners. Uh, in the majority of uh, explain. I didn't explain how. <laughs> the question is to him how. Uh, actually, it's clear how. If the United States and their allies would have stopped providing Ukraine with the defense equipment and arms, the conflict would have been over a long time ago. I answered your question. <laughs> okay, okay. okay one, one more question. But, uh, the impact on the world is not from the conflict per se. It's not from Russians fighting against Ukrainians or Ukrainians against Russia. It's not about that. It's about the response from the West. It's about the measures taken uh, by the West to weaken Russia. They, they admit openly or uh, the best to destroy Russia, to make it disintegrate like the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, the impact comes from the sanctions. And of course, you know, I'm not saying that uh, sanctions actually uh, uh, do not affect the way we are doing business. But we're just, we're just, you know, uh, the hope for the West was that our economy would be destroyed, uh, that Russian people will suffer, because what is the reason of introducing sanctions? Whatever they say, you know, don't believe the word. It's to make people suffer and overthrow the regime that they don't like. But it didn't happen with Russia because our economy adjusted, uh, our economy is very resilient, and in a sense, uh, the, oh, I'll give you the example. You know, while Germany is in recession, we are growing like three, four percent per year. Our GDP. Of course, we cannot compete with Indonesia, 5%, which is wonderful, but still we, our economy is good. Uh, while uh, the countries that introduce sanctions are in, in recession. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, these uh, this, uh, sanctions are a blessing because uh, the big transnational companies left, Russian business comes. Because before, some of the Russian businesses could, could not compete with these big transnational companies, you know. But now, they're there, and they're developing their own businesses. Uh, again, uh, Russia is the biggest uh, country in the world in territory. We have natural resources, you know, oil, gas. We have a well-educated population. We have technologies. So, you know, just give us time. Of course, uh, you know, if we didn't produce smartphones it's because we didn't feel the need, we could buy it from other countries. If we cannot, we can produce our own. If we can produce uh, sophisticated defense equipment like Sukhoi 35, of course we can produce pretty much anything. But uh, it's just, it's not that we want to, you know, just to close and go up and we want, we want to have normal relations with other countries. And of course, uh, the financial sanctions, they hurt, of course, because it's, uh, for instance, it's not easy to, you know, uh, you go to Russia, you will not be able to use your card. You have to bring cash. Or I'm not, I cannot use my card here in Indonesia because of the financial sanctions. Or to make transactions between banks, it's not possible, possible right now for for uh, uh, Russian businesses, but there are ways, there are ways, of course. So uh, our businesses have uh, adjusted, uh, our economy has adjusted, and um, we see a very big interest uh, from our companies and our businesses towards Indonesia and ASEAN as a whole. Because, well, it's the reality that before, our, before the crisis, our a big majority of our business was oriented towards Europe. And it's understandable because we are close, uh, we have extended relations with the European Union, it was 
our number two trade partner after China. Uh, but they see the they just cut all the ties with us. It was not we who wished that that's what they did, and actually they shoot themselves in the, in, in, in the feet. Now they're, because they don't have any of our cheap natural resources anymore, they are, their economy is in recession. So, uh, of course, uh, we are affected by that, but we adjust and uh, it's getting better and better. 